Keith, a very good morning to you. Good morning. You don't mind being described as off the balls, Keith Wood, I'm assuming. That's it's, absolutely that's fine. Right. Yeah, that's, that's cool in the gang. That uh, full piece is going out, I believe, later on. You had a good half hour sit down with yeah, the Yeah, he was in great form, actually, yesterday, Lawrence. And uh, he gets a, as excited with these sort of tournaments as I do myself, mm. which is, uh, yeah, he's good. We're going to get into these sort of tournaments very shortly, but you have brought in an amazing gift for us because we're trying to encourage everybody that comes in to give us a little bit of something that's important to them. Like the benchmark has been set with Conor Murray's boots that, that are behind you there from the uh, from the Lions. It was a bit of a smell actually when I came in. You know, I think that's just all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you've brought us in this. Let me see if we can get the. Uh, is that? Am I got it? I got it right. Let's go this way. So this is a poster, if we can get the focus, there we go. Four good reasons to pick up a rugby ball and run very, very quickly. Yeah. So this landed in the office, Keith. So this is the 97 uh, Lions Tour to South Africa, and it landed in the office during the week. And I thought, oh, that's an interesting photograph of four of the Irish Lions from the South African Tour. And then I uh, looked it up. And there weren't any other Irish lines on the South African no, tour. Was, that was it. It was the four, I'm yeah. I'm really surprised and about that's that. That's kind of uh, reflective of Ireland's status, I think, at that stage. You know, yeah. we, we, and I'm going to leave that down And it was a bit, of a, a, bit of a surprise. That was an ad that the IRFU did after it, so we came back. I even remember that... Um, that photograph, I think it was really. Uh, yeah, I think it was Billy. Where did you? Billy took you got it, it done here before was, you went off. Uh, no, that was down on uh, the beach in Umschlange Rocks in Durban, right. and we were to try and look arrogant. So there you go. So <laughs> was, uh, was that a look that came? Uh, sort of well, I have to or? say, it yeah. suited me fine because it got, got rid of my double chin. So I was kind of looking up. <laughs> You're looking sort of wistfully yeah, into the uh, distance. Wistfully or imperious or I don't know what. We're gonna uh, we're gonna find a nice little spot for it somewhere yeah. around here. Well, you, you need it, you know. That's, yeah. No, it's great. Uh, and the studio is fantastic, by the way. It's brilliant. Um, the another thing that stood out for me when I started digging into the 97 tour and the four Irish lines that were on the tour none of them were playing for Irish provinces at the time we had no Irish provincial players on that 97 tour no and actually um, previous to that uh, like we see uh, Paul Wallace there in the middle of that um, he wasn't picked originally the claw the got claw injured was picked, but the claw was picked playing for Queensland Right. at the time right. so, um, and he turned up to the training session and couldn't run on so. day one he got injured yeah it? yeah. Right. It was, uh, almost entertaining <laughs> uh, his back wasn't great he thought it would be fine but um, he kept falling and that was training right and then at that point Paul Wallace comes in and Paul comes in and uh, totally from nowhere really um, and Jason Leonard took him under his wing and while he listened to everything that he was told and uh, while he got picked <clears> ahead started of him, all he three tests and you know, we, we were, like, Wally was about 16 stone at the time. I was about 17 and a half, nearly 18 stone. Tom Smith was 16 stone. Um, the guys opposite us were, Oz Durant was 21 and a half stone. Naka Drotsky was 19 and a half stone. Right. And Adrian Garvey was 19 and a half. They're huge. Yeah. And Wally, myself and Tom were kind of, like, Tom was a couple of inches shorter than me. There were, you know, myself and Wally are the same, sort of six foot height. The guys were huge. Yeah. We just went low. And uh, Wally well, did an incredible job. I mean, absolutely. And Oz Durant, who was at that stage just, you know, the business. But we kind of made them a bit uncomfortable. We were a bit too low. We used their weight against them, maybe. Martin Johnson described him as his player of the tournament afterwards, which was incredible for a guy who only got drafted in at the last minute. Yeah, I, th I, th I thought Wally was incredible. I actually thought Jeremy Davidson was incredible. Yeah. And and another guy who got a lucky break, right? There was an injury to Doddy Weir at some point over yeah. the warm-up games. and Well, there's... if. That's the nature of a Lions tour. You, you get a chance, can you take the chance? But he was, and for me, he was extraordinary because uh, I was having huge trouble with my lineouts at that stage. And um, I had a bad shoulder, couldn't practice as much as I'd like to. My throw was not a natural throw. I mean, it was staccato. It just mm -hmm. wasn't good. Uh, he could have picked any ball I threw to him. A dead duck I threw to him, he'd catch it. You right. know, he was phenomenal. And he... Like, I remember there was one match, he caught three balls one-handed just by grabbing the ball like that, which was kind of amazing, you know. But it was, yeah, it was great. I mean, it's funny because I was just looking through the stuff, what was appropriate to, to bring down um, during the week, and uh, this was gathering dust. I tried to clean it, I didn't do a great job. You've done a great job. job. I, I didn't do a great job before, <laughs> to be honest, now. But, um, so here, yeah, just in nice terms, you were struggling with the line-outs, was that injury-related or was it...? An awful lot of it was, was injury-related. I had a huge job. I, I broke my shoulder when... I sat on the bench for Ireland when I was 20. And the week after, I dislocated my shoulder in a game against Dungannon. And I was out. I had surgery. I was out for a year and I came back. It wasn't right when I came back. The, sur the surgery I had wasn't very successful. 
it kept causing me a bit of hassle and then it went again in 95 in the World Cup and I had a, a posterior dislocation which is very rare so it, my arm went out through my back so it's a really it's a really nasty injury and it took me 15 16 months to get back to play after after that it was a kind of triple surgery to get back at all to, to get play. back to play yeah right. and uh, so there was a couple of the surgeons I'd seen had said it's time to retire and I was 23 you know you don't want to retire and I found a great surgeon uh, Bailey in uh, in London and he said I know you'll you'll play you'll be fine you'll hurt though and you know he was just he was like for me now he was my guru for the rest of my career and I had a few other operations I think I in in total I've had 12 on my shoulder 11 on my shoulder one on my elbow um, but in all that period of time every time I came back from one of the surgeries I was totally confident that it was fine. He was an, he was an amazing guy, right. uh, almost as a mind guy as opposed to the carpentry in my shoulder, you know, but it was, um, so it was difficult at times and it really, it got, um, like I changed my throw during that tour, I can remember it, I used to hold the ball with two hands in the front and by the end of that tour I was holding it behind my head. So it had taken me that level of confidence to try and get right. there and I'd had an operation six or seven weeks, two operations, six weeks and 12 weeks before that Lions tour. So I was trying to get my arm stable, you know, to try and, and go. And it was so you couldn't actually lift your hands above your head due to the... No, I, I could, but it was the security. I was confident there with the ball and I wasn't that confident that I could stand from here and throw it. So I was having to go from there to there to there. And of course, as I pulled it back, You're losing their, guys were, no, their guys were going up right. in the air. So I was trying to thread a needle and it was... And it just affects your confidence. You're trying to you're trying to do it. It's your job, and you have to do it. I struggled. I struggled with it manfully, to be honest. Um, and it wasn't really until about, I'd say, ninety nine, two thousand, where I just got my head right mm. about it that I could trust my shoulders and and be able to throw the ball. And it doesn't mean I won every line out after it. But my my that was four went, years after the very initial one. Is that yeah? Right? Uh, after the first operation, seven I'd say seven right. years nearly. And but the the big one in in ninety five. So in at that stage, I just had the sense of confidence that I could actually do it. But in the middle in the middle of that was strange things. I lost my spin. I couldn't spin the ball at one stage. I couldn't figure out why. From the throw or general? Oh, I was just throwing the ball. It was just going like like a ball, it, like a soccer throw. There was no no spin on the ball and I realised it took two goes maybe not the sharpest tool in the box took two matches to figure out that actually I'd strapped my arm because I'd had a bad bang in my forearm and the, the rotation comes from there mm. for the spin on the ball and I had that fully strapped because I was hurt mm. I couldn't actually rotate it so once I took the strapping off it was back again you know and here, like how does that stuff not does it get inside your head because I mean oh totally it, does it totally yeah. Yeah. like from to a yip situation almost or oh I had, we, we played in the World Cup in 99 this is where I can remember the days right so in, in 99 we played against Australia in uh, Lanzone Road I threw unbelievably well and I lost four lineouts I could have lost every lineout. John Eales was magic. The Australian um, uh, lineout was incredible. They literally, um, they they were an inch away from every lineout ball, and it, which terrified me. Mm. So, even though we won twelve or thirteen lineouts, I lost four. Um, I could have lost twelve or thirteen, and I it actually shook my confidence. Yeah. I said, and I'm st I, th I thought I was throwing well, and I'm throwing well, and I'm losing them. I mean, what the hell? Mm. And we'd, we'd seen a, we'd had a sports psychologist that had come in earlier in the year, and I, I can't remember his name, and I wasn't very keen on, on him anyway. Mm -hmm. But he said one thing that, uh, that struck a chord, which was kind of like a happy Gilmore thing, which is kind of find, find a, a place where you're confident and use a trigger word or a series of words to get back to that if you're feeling very low, which, yeah. is, a, which is a good idea. Yeah. Hard in practice, and, uh, but a good idea. And once you spend a bit of time doing it and concentrating on it and feeling buoyant and confident and capable that you're able to do it, I say, okay, that's good. And the first line out I threw against, in that dreadful day against Argentina in Lens, um, I threw it to a guy I don't throw to that often, and it was picked off. And I went into total panic. Right. And so I'm on the field in panic, speaking my little happy place mantra to myself. And if the camera had panned on me, I'm talking to myself for the next two minutes. While I'm running, talk, trying, to, trying, to, trying to tackle people, yeah. trying to play the game, chatting to myself like slightly psycho. And, um, and I, I won the next 16 out of 16 lineouts. And actually that 
sorted it for me. And it just meant, actually, I knew, I'd, uh, I, knew I could get out of the panic. Mm. There was anxiety there, and I knew I could actually get out of that in that situation if it happened again. And by having that in, just knowing I had the safety blanket, it actually meant my throwing improved. I felt far more relaxed. What are you saying to yourself? Something good is going to happen. That was it? Was the phrase, yeah. And, uh, and it just took the pressure off me. And, it, like, it's interesting, and I've... I, I dabble in the psychology stuff from reading some of the books and stuff like that. And actually, if you look at Bob Rotella in golf, and actually some of the golf is not a game of perfect or it's a game of confidence, mm. all th those books. Mm. He talks about elements of those, and I've, I've been lucky enough to play golf with some of the guys that he has ri written chapters about. And it's their way of how to deal with doing something bad. How do they then mm. do the next thing right? Mm. And it was really, it was a great thing to learn, but it actually, in terms of... It was like a salve onto my anxiety. So the next time I went to play, it just didn't mean I was going to win everyone, but I just wasn't worried about it. it makes a big difference. We're at Telfer and McGee can dig oh. into the psycho psychological nature of things uh, in the 97 tour. Because like, you even read the, the media reports in the lead up to the tour, and it seemed that everybody was like, oh, the, the Lions are coming down to South Africa, they're just here for a party, don't worry about them. If yeah. they get the win, it's a bonus. I'm sure that sort of stuff would have been used for positive psychological stuff. Yeah, there was a, I mean, there was a bit of that. I remember actually saying it, that I used to do a lot of um, visualisation. Mm. And I remember the guy said, no, you don't. I said, well, I do. And they said, well, you know, you've never mentioned it before. Well, I haven't mentioned it before, but how would you know that I'm not? And I used to sit down and, um, again, visualize how you do certain things in certain parts of the field or in certain situations. And then by the time I finished playing, I was doing that in the game. So if you're standing on, a, on, on the touchline when their hooker is throwing it in, and if it, so I'd go through it very quickly in my head. If he throws to the front, I'm going to do this. If he throws it to the middle, I do, if he throws it to the back, I do nothing. Mm. You know, and, and just kind of see it before it happens and then you react a little bit faster and there are all those things that you're trying to do as as a sportsman. McGeekin was different. He wouldn't do he would do a motivation but he wouldn't do it in a in a fashion where it would be kind of uh, let's kind of psych you up. He just I think he got us all in the same mind which was amazing. Telfer was a perfect guy for forwards. The backs would never be able to really deal with Telford. He was mad as a brush, mm. you know, and brilliant though, but technically brilliant. So that when you train, you suddenly start training in exactly the way everybody started doing the same time. So we all got to do things by repetition, which is the key, and to any skills, but to try and get everybody put together in a short period of time, yeah. it, it was great. I mean, we'd have killed him if we were there for another week. We were wrecked, <laughs> really, we were yeah. wrecked by the end of it, yeah. but, but it was worth it, like, absolutely yeah, worth yeah, yeah. it. Everyone I, met him, I met him recently, Did yeah, you, yeah? he's just, he hasn't changed at all. Yeah. Everyone feels they know the 97 lines inside out. Like, I had the, I remember being at college and having the cassette tape, yeah. and it was, this was currency, like, this was, everybody wanted to get the cassette to watch this yeah, thing. It was the yeah. first time that we got a look behind the, sort yeah. of, the curtain of these things. But it kind of struck me, actually, just talking about that psychology, psychological aspect that the two lads were probably way ahead of their time in that regard because almost everything they were doing was tapping into that sort of psychology of the motivational aspect and the like there weren't YouTube clips around then you know you no. talk about Bob Latella and the, I know Brian O'Driscoll has talked about it before that when he went to a small bit of a slump at some point in his career he looks up a lot of YouTube clips and doing stuff that I do well that point that you make but yeah. you know he didn't exactly have YouTube back in uh, 97. No and it's funny we had um uh, one of the girls outside, Marianne, is in there. My, we had a, a CD made for ourselves and it was a piece of music that we liked and um, we would say five things that we believed to be true about ourselves and five things that we wished were true. And right. we would say the ones that we wished as if they were true. Right. Right. It's a really good idea. And I did mine to So Long Marianne by Leonard oh, Cohen. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, what a I tune. I was laughing yeah, when, yeah, yeah. Uh, when I met Marianne outside. And... Um, and it was again, we were, like everybody was just trying, you're trying to get whatever, um, you just want to get better all the time. And, uh, and it's then you're, you're saying the, these things or you're hearing your own voice. So you, we recorded our voice speaking over the song. Mm, that's class. And so you're listening, you know, going to a game, things that you're saying about yourself, you yeah. know. It's so. a pretty emotional tune as well. Like it's. Well, I like, you know what? It's, I just, I like Leonard Cohen, yeah. you know. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it, don't think you can read too much into the music. I just, I liked it and uh, yeah, it was a bit of fun. It's time that we began to talk about the Six Nations. 
Absolutely. Um, it's a good paraphrase. Uh, listen, there. we've got um, we've got a bunch of comments coming in. Do keep them coming in and hashtag OTBAM or drop a comment into the Facebook uh, page. We've got a very neat prize as well to send somebody away for a weekend pass to Leprechaun for the best uh, comment so far. So keep them coming in. Uh, one from Neil here. Woody's an absolute warrior. My old fella always told me to watch him play and do what he does on the pitch. I failed. Uh, winky face says uh, Neil there. Um, we haven't had you in to talk about the team since it was named, so yeah. maybe let's get into some of that. And yeah. James Ryan particularly was one of the kind of interesting selections that I wanted to focus on initially. Um, I uh, Comparisons with Paul O'Connell was one thing that was made by Sean O'Brien during the week, yeah. who said that he expected this guy to be better than Paul O'Connell. We're always trying to manage expectations of young players coming through, a 21-year-old second row, uh, comparisons like that probably aren't all that helpful, but this guy does seem like he's a star on the rise. I, I remember being asked at the BBC a good few years ago about um, Gary Ringrose, and they said, is he the new um, Brian O'Driscoll? And I said, no, he's the new um, Gary Ringrose. Mm. So I don't go in for those things at all, and I think it's... Uh, I know it's the nature of, of this game and of everything that we have to do that you try and go for the closest comparative and say that this is the guy or this is the guy we want him to emulate or surpass or whatever it is. Um, I'm really impressed with him, the, the way he plays. And I said it uh, during the week that um, I'm a little bit surprised he's picked. Um, because the experience thing. No, and no, no, it's not actually. I, um, I think this is a, this is a physic. This could be a physically very tough game, mm. and he's a young guy. Um, that's not a criticism at all. Actually, I think he deserves his place in the team. I just want to make you know. I'm hoping that we manage him properly for the first couple of years because you don't want him to be. Uh, I, I want him for the next thirteen or fourteen years in an Ireland jersey. That's the way that's the way you have to look at it. So that's the comparison as opposed to, to a player. You just know that he has got the skills and the qualities and the work ethic uh, and the mind that wants to get there and do all that work. He has shown all the signs of that so far. So for that it's it's brilliant, you know, and so I think I think he's um, I think he has been nothing but quality all the time. Yeah. He makes a few mistakes um, but for a big guys, body position is, is, is very good going into contact. Um, good line out forward, v just very capable. And um, you know, it, it's a huge, huge vote of confidence mm. to pick him for an away match. Away matches are so tough in the Six Nations. We kind of gloss over that every now and then. Um, actually, Lawrence uh, came up with a, a comment yesterday. If you take away the Italian results, there was only one win away last year in the right. Six Nations. That was England right. in, in Wales. And you know, it is an issue. It is hard. It is very, very difficult. But um, look, I think he's class. Mm. And I just um, manage properly means yeah, you play him here and you play him, and he may get a week off, and you play yeah. him, again and that's would be perfect. And not no, I would always say the coaches know best, so they'll have uh, he'll have been tested. They'll know how resilient he is. They'll know what he's able to do, and they're obviously comfortable with it. And that's fair enough. I think Liam Tolland was making the point in the Irish Times this morning that Ireland conceded six tries after the defensive line-out in the Six Nations last year. Is, does that start, start really represent a problem? Um, it, I don't think it does. And actually, I was watching the Champions Cup um, for the last few weeks and listening to some of the commentators complaining about Leinster going up in the air. They're taking a calculated punt, and in some cases that might, may lead to a try for the opposition, but it may also lead to a steal and it's how they balance those up. You can't do everything all at once. And you're playing against good teams and this fits into it. So um, I think they will pick and choose when they want to do it. If you knew, and here's, here's a simple example, if you knew that Ireland uh, were afraid of being pushed over from, from a line out and they weren't going to put anybody up in the air, you could throw the ball lower. Right? Mm. You know, just to make certain that it's, that it's, it's right and perfect. Mm. Get your setup really, really secure without having to go to the highest height. So that's fine. You think that's happening. Suddenly Peter Mahoney is thrown nine feet in the air in front of the ball. You've lost the ball. Mm. You know, so it is, it's all guessing and counter-guessing and managing what your percentages are in different positions. So uh, I remember we used to get criticised at times for trying to, we lose a ball maybe at the back of the line-out. But it was the best place to play from. Probably an easy enough tr throw and not with people 
two guys up in front of the ball, it was a great one to do. People say, because that's a much harder throw. It isn't actually harder, it's easier. So it's, it's trying to look at it in that idea, try to think of what's going through the heads of both of them, as opposed to making a comment that, you know, we're not good at that. Ireland are good in that position. It's what they choose to do at particular periods of time. It's probably fair to say that they're not going to take that risk early on against France. And I think Joe Schmidt has talked a lot about the opening 20 minutes. Yeah. We saw what happened to Scotland. Yeah, and that's, look, that can happen too. And, but... Look, one thing we know about Joe Schmidt teams is that he has analysed everything to, to death. Now, he'll be driven to distraction by having a new coach with new players and not really having seen them play before. Mm. Um, but, you know, he, he'll still have, he'll have all the relevant information in there. And Brunel will do something different, something that hasn't been done by, um, uh, by France in the past mm. because he'll want to keep guys checking. Um, one of the other interesting things is the front row, and I was actually driving around the other week listening to yourself <coughs> and Liam Toland dissecting the front row. I think it might have been in the it was the Munster game when it was dead and buried, yeah. and we had a good, uh, you had a good sort of chew. Random, a random. It was chat, brilliant. I, um, say. But he, so he goes from McGrath here in the front row, um, as opposed to Healy, which was sort of the opposite almost of the November, the two big games in the November internationals where it was Healy who kind of got the got the nod. Now, who knows what's going on in the background with all this sort of stuff, but I know Leo Cullen has said about McGrath, particularly that he's got his head in the game now and he's very focused. What's your take on that? Is it a kind of a horses for courses thing? Or? You know, I, I'm, I'm sitting in here saying, God, I actually thought he picked Healy. So did I. Has he gone for yeah, Healy? Well, that's maybe my bad yeah. then, yeah. I, 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 I actually haven't checked the official, like the, <laughs> the Rory and Jerry Thornley teams were all started Keen Healy. Yeah, no, it's... And, I, I, uh, yeah. maybe, maybe I've got that back to front. What's your... Keen Healy. It is Keen Healy. Yeah, there you go. God, so, I thought so I was flip, that, so flip, that, flip that question. Uh, I would have gone with Healy. Yeah. And I would go with Healy because he shed a bit of weight. He looks energetic. Um, he, you know, he needs to make certain his discipline stays in check. And he absolutely has to do that. Um, but I think, uh, I think McGrath played an awful lot of rugby in the last couple of years. And I think the Lions took a bit out of him. Did it, yeah. And I think that does happen. And so certain guys go on the Lions tour and they haven't played a huge amount of rugby and they come back from it. And actually, yes, it was very hard and very taxing physically and mentally, but do you know what? I don't have a huge miles on the clock in the last 12 months. I'm fine. Mm. Some don't. It takes a bit longer to come back from it. So he was a bit slower coming back. But let's, let's not write him off. How great we are to have a situation, to have the two of those guys. One who is and has been kind of on the top of his game this year, another one who hasn't, but who's coming back to it, playing really well. And a lot of guys then down in Munster who are trying to get into, into that subs jersey as well. And so there's great pressure there, and great depth in it. So I'm not worried about those because the conversation has changed as well on the first 15. Because you still want to be the guy that can finish out the game at the end. So it's just it's just the finishers. I mean, you buy into the finishers. Like at our time, honest, honestly, if you were on the if you were not playing, you'd be unbelievably upset. Mm. And but that's pride, maybe. And that pride is kind of I'm not saying that that's changed, but there is more of a sense of a team being 23 and maybe more than that actually. Than and there is being 15. On that note, is Cronin? I mean, close to best now? Do you think? Is it the gap seems to have narrowed a bit? Um, I think Cronin is playing. He, he's he's back playing better. Uh, he really he really is. Um, uh, it look it comes down to lineouts. We were talking about it earlier on, mm. and uh, he still needs to sharpen his lineouts up a little bit more. I think they've got better, um, and it, it's. I think they're very close, but I also think. I see. I. It's a horrible thing to have to say that you're Ali Gunner, on the bench. But he's lethal when he comes off the bench because mm. the guys are a little bit more yeah. tired, and I, his, his acceleration through a gap is phenomenal. Mm. You know, okay. so yes, yeah. um, I, I I think he's a cracking rugby player actually, and um, and whether he's the guy that should be the finisher, does it, does that make you a little bit surprised that Andrew Porter didn't make the bench? Then I know John Ryan obviously brings probably better scrummaging, is that fair to say? But in terms of that, I suppose that dynamism and when the game opens up in the last 20 minutes, what we saw what Andrew Porter yeah, would do. I do. I'm not surprised. Sure. And I, I, I'm unbelievably surprised that, that he has been um, selected for an international already. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing thing at his age in that, in that position. Mm. Um, he's a guy we're going to mind too, you know. And I don't know that you want, want him in Paris in the first match up, coming off it and suddenly coming against some wizened French prop that could turn you inside out and there's no running around the field. That works. He's still starting and getting there. 
but he's a guy. I mean, I can't get over between him and James Ryan. They're the two guys that I get really excited by because I think they're guys that are there for 10 years, mm. 10, 12 years. You know, I, I think that's, that's fantastic. The so, so there's no rush with him. And John Ryan is... John Ryan's a hard, nuggety player. I mean, he's improved out of sight in the last couple of years. He really has. And he's a better scrummager. Now that we've put Keen, uh, Keen Healy back in the team, let's have a quick... We're going to get your thoughts on the uh, tens battle as well, Keith, but we just want to take a quick clip here. CJ Stander, who was talking during the week about uh, France's rookie, 19-year-old out half. I think, look, if he's uh, good enough and he gets a chance and uh, he, he can grab it, you know, it's, it's, in fairness, it's great for him to back him and let him play. And I think he's an exciting player and he brings a lot um, when he plays for his club, you know, so I'm um, looking forward to uh, playing against him. CJ, have you talked about maybe protecting Johnny given what happened the last time? Because there's been an awful lot of talk about the last game coming into this one. I think uh, Johnny's a big boy. He can look after himself. You know, <laughs> I think um, he showed that over the last few years. And every time we played against him and with him, you know, he looks after himself. I think we all have jobs, you know, but um, as a collective, we're going to work hard to look after each other because uh, we're an Irish side that uh, want to go out and, and play our game and make sure that uh, everyone is, uh, in, in, I'd say, looked after. Yeah. Yeah, CJ Stander uh, talking there during the week. I'm assuming, Keith, that he is running down Jalabert's channel in a pretty big way pretty quickly. Uh, I think it would be rude not to, <laughs> you know. And, um, yeah, you have to try and introduce uh, young players to international rugby yeah. as a team that picks them, but also as a team that's picked against them. And, uh, yeah, I, look, I think it's... A, it's a, it was very interesting. Um, Sant Andre said that he thinks that there is a lost generation of players, of young guys that um, were were in France that didn't get an opportunity to play at the clubs because of the foreign guys that were in there. Interesting. We'd been saying that for years, you know, bemoaning that fact. And it's it's interesting to to hear a French coach then after after he's out of the job come back and then say it. Um, so they have to start somewhere. They have to start bringing guys through and Jalabers is good, fast, again, capable, really good guy. 19 years of age, that's tough. Uh, I'll go back 28 years and 20, or, um, uh, it's 28, 18 years. God, God, I'm not that old. <laughs> and I was just trying to figure out that was going to put uh, Driscoll at 48. <laughs> He's aging very heavily. Uh, uh, that uh, Draco is 20 years of age, scored a hat-trick in Paris. So let's not get too excited mm. by that, that a guy can go and do something special on a, on a big day like that. Uh, for me, against a lot of teams, I think he might I don't think, get away with it, but um, he's going to be playing against a 10 that is very disciplined, very organised, uh, very capable. It, the pressure will be relentless. Um, I don't expect Ireland to give up too many mistakes, so I think it's, he'll do some brilliant things. He absolutely will, because that's in his, that's mm. in his nature, Jalabert. But... Um, uh, can you sustain that for 60, 70 minutes? That becomes very difficult mm. when you're building it around that guy. So, um, look, I think I wouldn't read too much into it. Uh, I, my view is that they're looking at changing the French team entirely over a two-year period. Um, and that they can suck up the results in the meantime almost? I, I think they will because the results have been poor anyway, trying to play in, in the stodgy fashion that they've played. At so least if there's a bit of progression then. I, I yeah. think so. So if they, if they can do that over two years with a view for, for having a good showing in the World Cup in Japan. But this is a guy at 19 that in six years' time, or in, in, um, in 2023, um, five years' time, he'll be the... Um, you know, he'll be 25, mm. absolutely in his, in his prime, unorganised, and there'll be a lot of other guys with it. So I think they're building for, for next year's World Cup, but they're also building for, for their home World Cup in 2023. A couple of quick questions fly through here from comments that have come in for us from Ed uh, Redden, uh, Renison here. He says, on, line on lineouts and Schmidt, is he vulnerable to things like quick lineouts and quick penalties because he plays such a rigid, structured game? No, because the discipline that is inherent in it is to be in the position for quick lineups, to be in the position for variation. And look, all these coaches are analysing everything to, you know, beyond all things. So of course, if someone does something that you've absolutely never seen before, that could be, that could be great. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in my time, which um, I remember just to show you levels of complication, we had 250 lineups. 
um, in back in 2001. And what we used to do at that stage was pick a, a suite of ones that we'd use for one match, use another one for another we thought was suited. We didn't kind of use them all the time. So you would try and keep them guessing yeah. from one match to the next and not do them. So um, there was the one I scored the, the try uh, against England in 2001. That was a lineup we'd used three years before, and we hadn't used it since. We practiced it once that week. We practiced it in the warm up, and that was the one yeah, we used. Go, yeah. You know, so nobody knew where to go. Tomas and Periscope here says the French will run at Ireland uh, ball in hand. Ireland and Leinster teams always struggle against these teams. Uh, does Keith think that Ireland will struggle if the French just stick to ball in hand and run at Ireland? Uh, I would say Ireland's defence in the last couple of years has been phenomenal. Um, we drift off a little bit when our attention isn't right and we started poorly in the last two Six Nations. If we start poorly and don't get our energy level up and our attitude exactly right to meet the battle in the first minute, we, we do struggle in that, mm. absolutely. But because we failed in the last two you know, slow starts in the last couple of years, I actually just don't think we're going to do that this time. Mm. And we, we, you know, watching Leinster's defensive and Munster's defensive performance over the last um, the last few matches has been pretty impressive. It gives a lot of hope, all right. Like especially after being down there and seeing the Lalio piece yesterday, I'm unbelievably excited for the start of the Six Nations. But not only because it's that usual annual hype for it, also because. I think the standard is really high in terms of this being the best competition in the world. I think you can actually safely say that. And Liam Toland was saying this morning that he's not sure the All Blacks would win the Six Nations. Do you agree with that? Um, I, yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of uh, one that's thrown out there. I love this competition for, for the fact of the tradition, for the fact it isn't home in a way. You, don't, you can't get another chance to rectify a mistake you've made. If you've yeah. lost against England, you don't, you don't play against them for another 12 months. Live with that. You know, and that's the that kind of attitude is is great. Uh, the All Blacks, um, it's it's relentless. I look, the All Blacks would adjust to whatever they had to. Sure. You know, they have they f they're they're still, uh, you know, a, there's a good distance between them and the other teams. I think it's, it's interesting to see that the northern teams, England and Ireland in particular, are much further up the tree and much closer to New Zealand than they have been in the past, but New Zealanders still stand out on their own. So, um, I think the All Blacks would blitz. I mean, they would win the Six Nations. I mean, is that... I? Well, I, I think, I think Toland's point, to be fair, is not to do with the comparative quality, it's to do with the relentless nature of the Six Nations. Uh, relentless nature and also the style. Mm -hmm. So, yes, New Zealand can turn up on a day and play a particular style, and they've, they've done that. But the things that they struggled with on the lines, I think they may struggle with having to try and do that two or three weeks in the trot. Uh, before we plumb all you with some of the comments that have come in about your absence from the, your from people's TVs now over the Six Nations, I just want to get a quick thought on the bench because I think a lot of people were um, not expecting but hopeful that maybe Jordan Larmer might actually feature in the 15. He doesn't make the 23. To be fair to Fergus McFadden, obviously he's in the form of his life at the minute. Um, yeah. And if he doesn't make the 23 now, you almost think that his international career is done. But, um, I mean, at the same, by the same token, it would have been nice to have got a glimpse of this guy at the weekend. Well, I'd like to have seen him there, but I think, much as we talked about Andrew Porter, I think the same holds true for Armour, that maybe this isn't the place just to... Um, Hold fire to, a while. To, yeah, absolutely. But I think we're going to see both of those players play um, in a couple of weeks' time. I think that is part and parcel of it. Um, yeah, you would like to see it because he's exciting. And we, we're we all fans. You know, There's no way around that fact. We're looking at it. God, we really want to see him play. Joe's pragmatic. Mm. You know, And we don't agree always with, with what he says and does, but that's fine. That's, that's his job. And his job is to try and get the results and to do it, not to kind of uh, be nice to us and give us exactly what we want, which is like, like a talent like that, getting a chance to play. I just I want to see him on a, on a hard pitch. Um, like I, I can just, I know for myself, the, he terrorise you, you know, as a forward. I just, I'd hate to see him running mm. at me. I just, I just wouldn't like, you know, because he's got this total got step lateral step there. that you're kind that of guessing and you're saying, well, I'm going to give him one shoulder and he's gone on the other mm. shoulder and you're half turned and you're just <laughs> made to be... Look like an Egypt. You're, you're you know. there talking to yourself, saying something good is going I to know, come. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I, know, I, I kept that to the line outs because you, you, you can't be doing that. You, can, you can't dilute that down. You know, <laughs> something good is going to come, and he's yeah. going to step past you. Yeah, I, like the only one I could see as a comparison. They're very different players and do very different things. Was Billy Whiz, was Robinson, Jason Robinson, mm. and I. Jason used to do this little kind of. It wasn't a power step that Larmer does, but it was. 
like in this space, he'd confuse you. Mm. He'd have turned four times before he even got near no, you. He, it isn't even the turning. I just, you're just absolutely wrecked with doubt as to where he's going. Mm. So, and you like a little bit of certainty. Mm. So you're in a position, you have him, you have it lined up, that's great, I'm sorted. And suddenly there's a little skip in there and you have fresh air. And he may have jumped back, which he used to do, which mm. was quite, uh, quite embarrassing, where you're just lying on the ground yeah. and you haven't laid a hand on him and it's, yeah. you're feeling like a prat. Um, one flavour of the general sentiment that's coming in, and I'm going to read this one out from Kieran Adi for Keith. It won't be the same watching the TV coverage without Keith. Always great to hear his views, uh, but enjoy watching the Six Nations relaxing at home. You deserve it, he says. I'm looking forward to it, actually. It's been... Uh, Something it's different been, for you? Yeah, it's been a long time. So, 92 or 93 was when I kind of you know, started in the, uh, in the Ireland squad. Um, and that's my head was around Six Nations from then. So, it was work, if you'd call it work. I, I never really did, but... Um, and from that and then for all the Six Nations uh, with the BBC afterwards, which I loved actually. And for me, it was a great crutch. So I stopped playing rugby. I stopped at 31. My body was broken, but I was happy to stop. And I stopped under my own steam, which was kind of nice. Then I go into another team in the BBC and they were, they were brilliant mm. because you're still doing something that you love, and um, uh, which was really nice. And then that comes to a natural end too. Uh, you know, when, when they lost the rights to the Ireland game and I'm going to Cardiff and Ireland or in Dublin, I, you know, that's not what I wanted either. So uh, the idea to be able to say, well, actually, I'm also taking time off mm. because, I've, you know, I've got three young boys. I want to be at home a little bit more too. And it's kind of... Nice to watch I, some of the games with them as well. Well, imagine, it is. Yeah. You know, they yeah. love rugby too. So it's kind of, it's interesting um, uh, analysing games with my with my kids, you know. Mm. So it was funny. You I sit down and do the half time. We'll do some half time analysis. Oh, they, I tell you, they're, they're sharp enough too, you know, and argumentative as well, as you'd expect. And yeah, yeah it's good fun. But I was... It's funny, I was at a match recently, I, I think I said this the other day, I was at a match and I was chatting to one of the guys and there was a woman sitting behind me, she said, could you just speak up a little please? <laughs> <laughs> Which was kind of cool, yeah, was kind yeah, of cool yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. so, uh, but uh, yeah, I'm, like, I love it. So, and I actually have, I have to say it, in, in, so in the last year, um, I've actually got to, I think rugby has changed in the last year, I think it's become more exciting, I think the law, var law um, variations have been a benefit mm. to the competition. Uh, to all competitions, and I think there's a couple more that need to go. But I, I just think it it looks like a great game. Mm. Like in stark contrast, I think to 12 months ago, in the the way the game was, it, was, it seemed to be bigger last year, more grunt. Now it seems more about invention, mm. and so it's more enjoyable. And I've actually kind of re-engaged with the game as a fan again, which is nice. Well, we'll also be able to get your thoughts uh, every Wednesday night and off the ball as well. So okay. we're definitely looking forward to that, Keith. Thanks a million for the gift. Course. It's going up. We're going to find a place for it this afternoon. Thanks, William, for coming into us. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Great Keith Wood, as always, you. brilliant to have you in the studio. Hopefully, you'll come back and see us again.